for killing World Ender, putting this awesome party together, and for booking one of the hottest talents out there, Logic! Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 times Rick was actually nice to someone. I'm a bad partner because I never made you a true partner. The crows made me see that. I thought they were a joke like you, but it turns out they're more enlightened than any of us. For this list, we're looking at those rare instances that prove Rick Sanchez has a heart. Since this is Rick we're talking about, though, these don't need to be especially mushy. They just need to be the bare minimum of what's considered nice. What act of kindness surprised you the most? Let us know in the comments. Number 20. Complimenting Beth's Eggs the first episode quickly establishes that Rick isn't the best grandfather, or father, or father-in-law. I had to make a bomb, Morty. I had to create a bomb. What? A bomb? I'm gonna drop it down there and oh, get a oh, whole fresh start, oh. Create a whole fresh start. As drunk, selfish, and reckless as Rick is, at least he knows when to send compliments to the chef. Leaving the breakfast table, Rick praises Beth's eggs and wishes that his late wife were still around to share in their scrumptiousness. Granted, you could argue that Rick is sucking up to Beth, who is letting him live with the family and is desperate for her father's approval. This was a good breakfast, Beth. You really made the crap out of those eggs. I wish your mother was here to eat them. Oh, Dad. What? Rick also might have seen this as an opportunity to get under Jerry's skin. What? For real? Like we said, though, we will take what we can get with Rick. At least to some extent, we do think Rick was sincere about Beth's cooking and her mother. Number 19. Helping Summer Get Revenge on the Devil In the earlier episodes, Rick often brushes Summer aside, not seeing her as sidekick material. Maybe Rick can give you a ride. I'm helping Morty with science. I'm busy. Doing what? Uh, anything else? As the first season progresses, he develops a bond with his granddaughter, in some regards respecting her more than Morty. Their relationship reaches a turning point when Summer accepts a job with the devil, attempting to make Rick jealous. So what if he's the devil, Rick? At least the devil has a job. At least he's active in the community. What do you do? You eat our food and make gadgets. Bye bye After getting cheated out of the company, Summer turns to Rick for comfort. He provides it, in the form of a fist. Getting jacked up together, Rick and Summer set out to teach Lucius Needful a lesson. Between punches, Rick also learns a lesson about valuing and spending time with Summer. Why? Because sometimes what you really need is for someone else to pay a horrible price. Sure, he wasn't very nice to the devil, but he had it coming, as did several others they beat up. Get it to you. Number 18. Scary Terry Pep Talk A not-so-subtle knockoff of Freddy Krueger, you wouldn't expect Scary Terry to earn any sympathy points, especially as he hunts down Rick and Morty. Looks like some sort of legally safe knockoff of an 80s horror character with miniature swords for fingers instead of knives. I'm Scary Terry! You can run, but you can't hide, bitch! Turning the tables on Terry, the duo enters his dream to unearth the monster's deepest fears. To their surprise, it's not easy being scary, and it's even harder being Terry. In a classic bad dream scenario, Terry shows up to school without pants on and is condemned by his teacher. Why don't you tell the whole class the proper wordplay to use when one is chasing one's victim through a pumpkin patch? Oh, um, bitch. Oh, come on, Terry. Rather than kick Terry when he's down, Rick and Morty give him a confidence boost, as well as a pair of trousers. Hugging it out, Terry awakens with a new lease on scaring and two new friends. Oh, hey, it's you guys. I haven't seen him this relaxed in years. If you guys ever need anything, just say the word. Together, they conjure some twisted nightmares for others. Number 17. Creating Froopy Land for Beth Fatherhood didn't come to him naturally, but Rick is the only parent we can think of who made their child an artificial fantasy land, complete with a rainbow river. I can't believe it used to lock me up in this glorified chicken coop. Chicken coop? Those are procedurally generated clouds, Beth. That river is a rainbow, literally. Putting little Beth's safety first, Rick populated Fruby Land with a bouncy terrain, breathable water, and harmless creatures. Oh, how do you like that? What kind of merciless creator makes the ground bouncy? That said, this dream world eventually evolved into a nightmare world, with Beth's childhood friend Tommy getting trapped inside for years. 
It's also revealed that Rick created Fruppyland to distance Beth from the neighborhood kids, as she expressed the desire to harm them. Ray guns, a whip that forces people to like you, invisibility cuffs, a parent trap, a lightning gun, a teddy bear with anatomically correct innards. While he mainly wanted to spare himself the effort of having to clone anybody who got on Beth's bad side, Rick still cared enough to keep his daughter out of trouble and other children out of danger. Number 16, taking Morty to Atlantis. Whenever Rick drags Morty on an adventure, it's almost always guaranteed to be life-threatening and emotionally scarring. Th this was insane! That was pure luck! I was not in control of that situation at all! <laughs> in a refreshing change of pace, Rick takes Morty on a fun-filled adventure to the lost city of Atlantis. All right, Morty, you ready for our adventure to the lost city of Atlantis? Ready as I'll ever be, Rick! Of course, we hilariously never get to see this adventure, as the episode instead focuses on what the various other Ricks and Mortys are up to at the Citadel. Based on a post credit scene, however, it's clear the two had a blast. Upon arriving home, Rick fondly reminisces about the trip he just had with his grandson, most notably their encounter with some alluring mermaids. Moments like this demonstrate that Rick enjoys having Morty along for the ride, and is capable of showing him a good time. Yeah! We're going back for yeah! seconds! We're gonna yeah! do that shit every week, man! That was Atlantis! Number 15, telling Morty to leave him behind. Rick usually treats Morty as a means to an end, especially during the first few seasons. By the beginning of season five, Rick has become slightly less defensive about revealing his softer side. Commencing in the midst of explosive action, his episode finds Morty carrying a wounded Rick to the space cruiser. Come on, Rick, we're almost there. Ugh, leave me, Morty, it's the only way. With the clock ticking, Rick tells Morty to leave him behind and save himself. Although the audience half expects this noble offer to be followed by something sarcastic, Rick is convinced this might be the end of the line for him. I'm a silly man. I'm a silly small man. I'm, I'm sorry I got you into this. Then how about I get us out of this? He even reflects on his lifetime of mistakes and how insignificant he feels underneath his massive ego. Morty gets them out in the nick of time, but unfortunately lands on Rick's nemesis's turf. Richard, you have desecrated the sacred treaty betwixt land and sea. Now face the wrath of your once and eternal foe, Mr. Nimbus. Sorry, who is that? My nemesis. Number 14, blaming Morty's purging on a candy bar. When they land on a purging planet, Morty is reluctant to participate. Why don't we christen our squeaky clean windshield here by watching a little of this purge through it? What? No, what is your problem? Morty, grow up. If you don't want to watch, don't watch. Morty might be in denial, but he has a lot of repressed anger that he winds up taking out. As they depart from the planet, Morty isn't sure if he feels comfortable in his own skin anymore. I can't help but feel ashamed about what I did back there, Rick. I guess you were right. I've got a lot of repressed stuff I need to deal with. Rick spares Morty's feelings, telling him that his purging was influenced by a candy bar he ate earlier. Turns out they have a chemical in them called purginol that amplifies all your violent tendencies. Oh boy, Woo. thank goodness for that, huh? That's a relief. However, it turns out that the candy bar is actually purginol free meaning Morty's actions were his and his alone. Since we doubt Rick would have overlooked this detail on the wrapper, it's safe to say that he wanted to relieve Morty of his guilt. Sometimes, lying is the nicest thing a person can do. Number 13, his semi-nice wedding toast. Bird person is among the few individuals in the multiverse who Rick considers a true friend. What the hell is a bird person? He's Rick's best friend. Although he's pessimistic about the concept of marriage, Rick shows up to bird person's wedding, albeit reluctantly. At the suggestion of Morty, Rick opens up at the reception, where he delivers a mostly ad-libbed toast. Despite getting off to a cynical start, the speech builds to a heartfelt climax as Rick calls Bird Person his best friend. Sorry, Squanchy. But, but, here's the thing. Bird Person is my best friend. And if he loves Tammy, well, then I love Tammy too. <laughs> to friendship, to love, and to my greatest adventure yet, opening myself up to others. He even accepts Bird Person's bride, Tammy, saying that he loves both of them. Unfortunately, this touching moment is ruined when Tammy exposes herself as a Galactic Federation agent and takes out Bird Person. Rick sees people die virtually every day without batting an eye, so his emotional reaction to Bird Person's sudden demise speaks volumes. Bird Person, no! <laughs> Number 12, his message for Noob Noob. Rick is at his evilest when he's blackout drunk. But even drunk Rick has a warm fuzzy side. You do have one thing that I'll never have. And that thing is the only part of the Vindicators with any value to me. If you know what it is, place it on the platform. In order to complete his final periculous puzzle, a recording of drunk Rick instructs the Vindicators to present something that he doesn't have. But they do. 
It's possible I got so drunk I felt like I was losing Morty to the Vindicators and maybe this is my way of saying, okay, you can have him, but only if you know how important he is, otherwise I'll kill you. Regular Rick comes to the conclusion that his drunk self was talking about Morty, who steps onto the platform. Morty's treated to a peaceful ride as drunk Rick confesses his affection for the viewer. As sincere as drunk Rick's words are, they aren't intended for his grandson. Even my own grandson is like, oh, the Vindicator is so cool. I mean, he's a moron. That's their demographic. But you're different, Noob Noob. Morty realizes that Drunk Rick made this message for Noob Noob, a Vindicator intern slash janitor who laughed at his joke. Um, thanks, Noob Noob. Regardless, Drunk Rick obviously thinks highly of Noob Noob, even if regular Rick can't remember him. Number 11. Rick and Beth Save Jerry Rick is far from Jerry's biggest fan. Unless maybe we're talking about Doofus Rick. Come here, Jerry! <laughs> <laughs> Whenever Rick has to get Jerry out of trouble, it's often out of obligation and under protest. Rescuing Jerry from hell, Rick makes it clear that he's doing this for his daughter and not his son-in-law. Rick, Beth, you love me after all! Uh, I love her. She loves you. Those credits don't transfer. That seems par for the course, but when personal misery is the only key to their escape, Rick takes one for the team. Rick apologizes to Jerry and, in his own way, expresses affection for him. I shouldn't have kept you in the dark about the deal I made with these evil dickweeds. Y you're way less cool than me, but it's not cool of me to celebrate that. If I'm genuinely cool, I should be able to love you, which I therefore do. Upon returning, Rick tries backpedaling, telling Jerry that he'd much sooner replace him than repeat what he said before. However, Jerry knows how Rick feels deep down, which is enough to make his day. You don't have to say it. No, I do. I'll replace you next time. Make no mistake, what just transpired will never happen again. 10-4, Captain. Number 10. Save Marta. When an innocent game of Roy, a life well lived, goes awry, Morty's consciousness is split among the NPCs. You're all my grandson, your name is Morty, you're stuck in a video game and I'm here to get you out. What about me? Am I your grandson? I just said everyone is! In game time, Rick, as Roy, spends decades trying to get the NPCs to leave, but he struggles to satisfy one named Marta and her followers. Marta eventually has a change of heart, but she chooses to stay behind as others depart. You really are a good grandson, you know that? I'm proud of you, Morty. Please, call me Marta. That's my video game name. Speaking of which, I do have one condition. Having caused so much trouble for him, Rick could have restarted the game and erased Marta. Instead, he pays to keep the game going so Marta can enjoy the time she has left. Special order. Some rich douche wants his last game to keep running. Hooked it up to an external battery and we're just supposed to store it. This doesn't just demonstrate Rick's affection for Marta, but also for Morty. After all, Marta is a part of him, proving that Rick wasn't lying when he declared his love and respect. What do I have to say? I love and respect you, okay? Too late for talk, Rick. Number 9. Fighting Voltimatron with Love I am Voltimatron, destroyer of worlds! One of many ordeals that Rick wiped from his memory, Morty learns that his body was once possessed by a parasitical alien known as Voltimatron. Science can't get Morty out of this pickle, but Rick has an ace up his sleeve. The power of love. It's me, your grandpa. I know I can be mean, but I love you, Morty. Rick tells Morty that he loves him, in spite of his constant ridicule, and that he needs to fight. Beth and Summer follow Rick's example, giving Morty the encouragement to force the alien out of his mouth slowly. Too slowly, actually, resulting in the family making fun of Morty and Voltimatron sliding back up. Jeez, Morty, come on, pinch it off already. <laughs> While Rick does fall back on bad habits, it's not every day that he expresses love for Morty or anybody, making this memory almost heartwarming. Number 8. Showing up to Tony's funeral When an alien named Tony uses his personal toilet, Rick's first instinct is to destroy him. <laughs> Affected by the widowed Tony's words, Rick fart bombs him instead, which we guess is nicer than shooting him. Tony returns for another dump, motivating Rick to ensnare him in a simulation of his idealized heaven. After Tony pieces together what's happening, he emerges with a new lust for life, which sadly results in a fatal ski accident. Jesus, I, I gotta process this. He may deny it, but Rick connected with Tony and is upset by this loss. Rick pays his respects at Tony's funeral, giving his father a cloning kit and cash. Returning to the toilet where he had a crude surprise for Tony, Rick reflects on what could have been a beautiful friendship. Enjoy using it all by yourself while you sit there and think about how nobody wants to be around you and how you ruined it for yourself. Number 7. Throwing an awesome party and cleaning up 
At the very least, Rick is a fun grandparent. Summer, you can't have a party. Ugh. Because I'm having a party. While Beth and Jerry are on vacation, Rick throws an epic house party, inviting an assortment of colorful characters who get along surprisingly well with Summer's classmates. Squanchy party, bro! Oh, squanchy! While Morty is stressed throughout most of the rager, Rick does try to teach him a valuable lesson about cutting loose. Of course, they cut a little too loose, as the house is ultimately trashed. Rick freezes time, however, giving him, Morty, and Summer six months to clean up. All right, that should do it. Whoa, what did you do? Uh, see, see for yourself. In the midst of repairing the house, Rick and his grandchildren find the time to make jack-o'-lanterns, de-pants frozen people, and go TV shopping. Rick genuinely bonds with the kids, bringing them in for a hug and a new catchphrase. I have a, <coughs> a new catchphrase. Oh yeah? W what's that, Rick? I love my grandkids. Aww. Number six, erasing Jerry's memory of the cat incident. Rick has put Jerry through figurative and literal hell, typically telling him to just suck it up. Jerry reaches his limit when he peers inside a talking cat's mind, traumatized by what he sees. I'm from outer space. Happy? No. Exactly, because no answer would be satisfying. Because it's a lie. Let's see the truth. What in the... Oh, son of a bitch! Jerry, don't! I want to see. Even Rick, who's usually so casual in the face of mayhem, is disgusted with the cat. Although Rick is nearly pushed to the edge, he can bring himself to live with what he saw. He knows that Jerry can't, however. Maybe Get the I'll... hell out of here! Oh, but oh, I got nowhere to get go! Out. Get out! Get out! Erasing Jerry's memory of what the cat did in order to talk, Rick spares him from any further emotional torment. Rick alone is left to remember the cat's monstrous deeds, whatever they were. Where's the cat? He, uh, he ran away. Did you scan his brain? Yeah. Did you find out why he can talk? He's from outer space. Rick regularly messes with Jerry's head, but in this case, it came from a place of empathy. Number five, reconnecting with bird person. When Bird Person is brought back as the villainous Phoenix Person, Rick isn't quick to give up on his bestie. Bring him out. Initiating best friend rejuvenation sequence. We come to see just how deeply Rick cares for Bird Person when he enters his friend's mind. We also get inside Rick's mind as he encounters a younger memory of himself. Bird Person fights the Ricks around every turn, content with staying cooped up in his own mind. It isn't until Rick reveals that Tammy had a secret child that Bird Person fights for his life. Are you gonna tell him or what? I was getting to it. I bet she didn't even tell you about the kid. About I am the sorry. what? I was wondering when you were gonna- I think I'd know if I had a kid. You're a memory. You know what he knows. Rick and Bird Person don't part on the best terms. Yet everything Rick does in this episode is driven by friendship and perhaps even love. He also makes another friend in Memory Rick, who has some reservations about one day becoming regular Rick. So what's my deal? Am I sentient? Do I have free will? Who does? Who does? Ha <laughs> Hey! Yeah, just stopped in to whip up a metacognition scanner so I can track down BP's fleeing consciousness without enduring as much Charlie Kaufman bullshit. Number four, completing Morty's adventure. To keep Morty as a sidekick, Rick allows him to take the reins on an adventure. Adventures are supposed to be simple and fun! Oh yeah, Morty, yeah, re yeah that, that, that's real easy to say from the sidekick position. Rick bets that their trip to a fantasy world will be a bust, but Morty is eager to prove otherwise. Well, Rick isn't wrong, as Morty gets into an uncomfortable jam with King Jellybean in the bathroom. Stay! Go with the flow! Stop! Y you're making me really uncomfortable! Rick deduces what happened, but instead of rubbing failure in the traumatized Morty's face, he tries to lift his spirits. Putting his own ego aside, Rick helps Morty complete the adventure and congratulates him on a job well done. And then we'll give the rest of the schmeckles to the villagers. Huh? Really? Sure, Morty, yeah. You know, a good adventure needs a good ending. Rick doesn't let King Jellybean off the hook either, obliterating him before disappearing through a portal. He might put Morty in constant danger, but that doesn't mean Rick isn't protective of him. This one's wrapped up neat and clean because we did it Morty style. Number three, tearing up over Morty. It's not often we see Rick's vulnerable side, but when an evil counterpart imprisons him, he can't hold back his deep-seated feelings. Planning to expunge him following an experiment, Evil Rick straps Rick C-137 in for a highlight reel of his life. Morty pops up in several clips, and upon seeing a memory of his baby grandson, Rick begins to cry. You're crying? While he doesn't say it, Rick appears distraught over the idea of leaving Morty behind. Morty is more than just a human cloaking device to him, which separates C-137 from other Ricks. Given the fan theories regarding Evil Morty, this moment might carry even more significance than we initially realized. However you read it, Morty was at the root of Rick's tears. I did a pretty good job back there for a human cloaking device. Saved your ass! Number 2. 
giving Morty his portal gun and connecting with crows. Priding himself on being the smartest being in the multiverse, Rick is reluctant to own up to his mistakes. When Rick replaces Morty with two crows, the results are unexpected in more ways than one. Okay, that's it. Two crows. You're fired. You know what? Eat shit. You're just trying to make me feel worthless. I never said you're worthless. In fact, I've given you a very clear metric of your worth. Two crows. Note, I didn't say three. Rick not only finds that the crows make pretty great partners, but he also recognizes just how badly he's treated Morty over the years. He decides to leave with the crows and learn from them, but not before passing his signature portal gun down to his grandson. I want you to have this. Oh, wow, I... You know what, Rick? You really have changed. Well, thanks, Morty. It's a bittersweet farewell and a testament to Rick's growth. While Rick and Morty do reunite for more adventures, perhaps their partnership won't be as toxic going forward. Who knew that crows could bring out such empathy? Can we make our first adventure fixing this? I, I keep thinking about lawn care. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Sacrificing Himself for Morty as 64 different timelines simultaneously spiral out of control, Rick, Morty, and Summer must use time-stabilizing collars to restore balance. Time is falling apart! We've got to get back to certainty quick! Give me your collars! Oh, oh man, don't, don't you have, have to, to fix, fix like 30, 30 of them? Morty, I have to fix three of them. And then there's 31 other versions of me that have to also fix three for a total of 96. One Morty can't get his collar to strap on, though, lapsing into the black void. Rick jumps in after him, but Morty loses his collar. Seeing no other alternative, Rick gives Morty his collar and sends him home. Rick doesn't have a backup plan and prepares to disappear into the abyss of Schrodinger's cats. Rick! Oh! Morty, where's your collar? I'll fix it. I dropped it! What the hell? What have you done to me, Morty? I'm okay with this. Be good, Morty. Be better than me. It all works out regardless as Rick finds Morty's collar and fixes it just in time to escape. In the moment, however, Rick was able to make the ultimate sacrifice so that Morty could live. When push comes to shove, Morty's well-being is more important to Rick than his own. Please, God, if there's a help, please be merciful to me. Yes, I did it! There is no God in your face! Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.